Henry Knox would rise up from a harsh start to stand as a freedom fighter and one of the best artillery generals in American history, as well as setting the precedent for the position of Secretary of War. During his life in New England, Knox and fellow colonists witnessed the French and Indian War, a campaign for control of North America from 1754 to 1763 between the French, their Indian allies, and the British-ruled American colonies. Ultimately, Britain prevailed in the larger World War, but the cost was substantial. With the war over, a depleted treasury, and a better understanding of the growth and success of the American colonies, Parliament started to reign in control of the colonies through taxation and in their policy of solitary neglect, with a new commanding military presence in the colonies. Following the French and Indian War, the working class in the colonies started to experience immense troubles due to these new imposing taxes that correlated with the Stamp Act of 1765. After coastal-wide protests, Britain caused a repeal of the Stamp Act, but had other taxes ready to be imposed against the colonists, further angering the residents. The British simultaneously created tension by bonding the colonies together with a common enemy, themselves. The colonists created organizations such as Sons of Liberty that revolted against the British and supported the drafting of a non-importation act, which prevented the purchase of British goods. During these times, while growing up in Boston, Knox was forced to drop out of school in order to support his family. He secured his own job at a bookstore to help support his family and eventually opened up his own storefront and became a colonial merchant. On March 5, 1770, Henry Knox witnessed history on the streets of his own hometown in Boston as he observed the massacre on King Street transpire. Knox was outraged at what the British had done and stated to the British officer, For God's sake to take his men back again. For if they fired, his life must answer for the consequences. This event had changed Henry's life. Henry, like many others in New England, felt the British were slowly taking away the freedoms of the colonists and now would go as far as to harm them, as in the case of the Boston Massacre. His love for reading would lead him to study on his own about military and artillery strategies. I always say Henry had two love affairs in his life. The first is books. The second later becomes his wife, Lucy. Um, his mother secured him a job with two local booksellers when he was a young boy. His father had abandoned the family. Um, and it really changes his life. Henry's forced to drop out of school. He was uh, attending Boston Latin, which is a school that still exists in Boston. Um, so he becomes self-educated and teaches himself Latin, teaches himself French, and really, really kind of finds a um, akin uh, partnership with, with what we think of as engineering. In 1772, Knox was inspired to take a stand against the British when he created the Boston Grenadier Corps. This group served as a local militia with the intention of protecting Boston from the British soldiers stationed there. During his time as a member of the militia, he would learn how to load, fire, and transport cannons, skills that he would later find out to be crucial in his military career. During this time of increasing tension in Boston, colonists championed the idea that they deserved equal representation in the Parliament if they were to be taxed by the British. On December 16, 1773, Knox was present at the infamous Boston Tea Party as a militia guard protecting his fellow members of the Sons of Liberty during their dumping of 342 chests of tea into the Boston Harbor. In 1775, fighting had begun in Massachusetts with a shot heard around the world at Lexington and Concord, only miles away from Knox's home. His in-laws, who were loyalists and British officer friends, urged him to aid the royal cause, but instead he stood with the rebels. On June 17, 1775, Henry Knox volunteered for service at the Battle of Bunker Hill to help the rebel cause. He served with distinction, and the word of his military prowess rose all the way through the ranks to George Washington. During the winter of 1775, George Washington arrived in Boston to take over the newly enacted Continental Army. Washington was impressed by Knox's bravery in battle as well as his engineering skills. In a letter to his wife, Henry stated that Washington expressed the greatest pleasure and surprise in meeting him and that Washington promoted him to colonel. Even with the support of Washington, the colonial military was unable to penetrate the British defenses in Boston until Henry advised Washington to try a different strategy. George Washington liked Knox's idea of retrieving cannons from the recently captured Fort Ticonderoga in northern New York. Knox left immediately for Fort Ticonderoga and returned with 59 cannons traveling over 300 miles in 56 days. During his return journey on December 17, 1775, Henry Knox wrote Washington asserting that It is not easy to conceive the difficulties we have had in getting them over the lake owing to the advanced season of the year and contrary winds. I have had made 42 exceeding strong sleds and have provided 80 yoke of oxen to drag them as far as Springfield. 
For his efforts, Knox received a promotion to Brigadier General and was given his own artillery force. Knox continued to serve with great valor in New England, but he received an order to report to Trenton, New York, as the war was shifting location. The British forces in Trenton were outnumbered and outgunned, as they had 1,400 troops compared to 4,300 Continentals. 520 inexperienced men were put under the direction of General Knox by George Washington. On Christmas Eve of 1776, George Washington devised a plan to surprise the British forces of Trenton by crossing the Delaware River under the cover of night. Knox had a big influence on the battle as he obliged to bring 18 cannons, some weighing as much as 1,750 pounds, across the flowing Delaware. Knox's gamble paid off as he was able to station his artillery around the British command center, giving the colonial army an effortless victory. It wasn't always a success for the now Brigadier General. Many incorrectly placed blame on Knox for the colonial losses at both Brandywine and Germantown. On May 31, 1777, Washington had heard enough as he sent a letter to Congress defending Knox, stating, General Knox, who has deservedly acquired the character of one of the most valuable officers in the service, and who, combating almost innumerable difficulties in the department he fills, has placed the artillery upon a footing that does him the greatest honor. For the next four years, the war raged on, going back and forth until in 1781, when the British were forced to retreat to Yorktown, Virginia, by surging the Continental Army. At the Battle of Yorktown, Knox would devastate the British forces with his artillery. Eight days after the Americans had begun their attack, the British surrendered, and the Continental Army had won the Battle of the War for Independence. Washington stated, No artillery could have been better served than ours. Knox also garnered praise from Marquise de Lafayette, a French military commander who served with great honor and bravery with the Continental Army, as he stated, Sir, you fire better than the French. And indeed, the development of your artillery has been the wonder of the war. Following the battle, Knox was promoted to Major General, the youngest to be promoted to the rank, at the age of 31. The war had been won by the Americans and they had gained independence from one of the most powerful military forces of the time, but now Knox had a much harder mission to help the growth of the now formally recognized United States. In 1785, Congress, under the Articles of Confederation, appointed Knox as the first Secretary of War for their nation. In his early years as Secretary of War, he advocated for a larger military academy, while the army would be mainly comprised of state militia. A few years later, Knox would maintain strong support for the ratification of the Constitution. Under the new federal government, Knox would continue to serve in office. His legacy includes the creation of the Militia Act of 1792 which created weapons factories and increased the purchases of weapons and stockpiled them in case of national emergencies. He saw the military had a permanent navy and championed the building of more coastal fortifications which protected America's coastline. On top of that, Knox gave Washington the idea of building the USS Constitution and other naval ships which would protect America on the seas during the War of 1812. Henry felt the building of these frigates were so important and he stated, our frigates should combine such qualities of strength, durability, swiftness of sailing, and force as to render them equal, if not superior, to any frigates belonging to any of the European powers. Knox also suggested the creation of the Military Academy at West Point, New York, to help train soldiers to defend America. Its first graduating class would serve with great distinction and honor in the War of 1812. On December 28, 1794, Knox wrote to Washington, notifying him that he would be retiring from his position. Washington was very surprised and quickly responded to his Secretary of War and a good friend in a letter stating, I cannot suffer you, however, to close your public service without uniting the satisfaction which must arise in your own mind from a conscious restitude, my most perfect persuasion, that you have deserved well of your country. Hamilton almost becomes an adopted son to, to Washington, but I... I don't see that with the Knox-Washington relationship. I see more of a brotherhood. Knox would return to his family and settle in Maine. Henry Knox rose up from a tough start to fight for independence and stood for the American values we hold dear today. His influence on the military and the office of Secretary of War is still relevant today. Even after his death, his legacy took a stand in the future, as during the War of 1812, both the USS Constitution and the first graduating class of West Point would fight for freedom. Henry Knox didn't only take a stand with his opinion, he also risked his life every day to stand for the American dream of life, liberty, and the continual pursuit of happiness.